Well, hi there. Glad you could check in with us here at the BDR Lunch Gathering. Appreciate your support. We've had more people subscribing. You know, you look down in the corner, there's a little subscribe button. And uh, when we reach a thousand, I don't know, balloons drop out of the sky or something. Uh, but it'll be good. So we hope you'll enjoy it. And check back with us at www.thebdr.net. Thanks. I am really pleased to have Tom Sullivan with us today. Tom is, I mean, he is the top of the mark. Uh, somebody mentioned earlier that uh, the one thing you're going to miss, you won't see him on top of the Empire State Building, but we'd have a hard time doing uh, the presentation from there. Uh, Tom is very graciously uh, agreed to talk to us about the uh, idea of FM antennas, uh, how to get the right one for your situation, and some of the things he's done over the years because the designs that Tom has come up with have changed the industry in many ways. And so he's going to talk about that, answer some questions if you have them. Uh, Tom, uh, we can invite everybody to hold their questions until you're done or uh, we can tell them to press their space bar or alternate A and unmute uh, any time here that uh, they want to come in. And I'll, I'll kind of leave that up to you uh, as to uh, how you'd like to do that. I'd say if anybody does have any questions, uh, they, they can interrupt and we can answer them. Okay. And if you are a little unsure, put it in the chat box. I'll watch that. Raise your hand. There's a little button down at the bottom and... Uh, I'll watch for that too, and we'll uh, have a good time together and enjoy some really important stuff. Okay. Uh, thanks for being here. Absolutely. Um, problem with the computer, the <laughs> email's coming and it dings. Um, I'm going to start off with a little history of where I came from, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, Electronics research was actually formed during World War II uh, when my father and uh, Carraway, who was from Evansville, were at the radio research labs at Harvard. And they were designing radio beacons to be used to locate bombing locations in Germany, which, as we all know, were used later. And the uh, Germans were in the Boston Harbor with submarines spying on their operation, gathering their information. So Mr. Carraway suggested to the group that his wife had gone to the airport in Evansville and we can rent a hangar and then Bob Sullivan can fly out with Charlie Banks and do the measurements in Indiana because the Germans can't get up the Ohio River. It's too shallow for their submarines and there's operations ready to blow them out of the water if they try to. And the P-47s were made in Evansville and the LSTs were made in Evansville and that's why they were made here because the Germans couldn't get to them. And, and at the end of the war, the Germans were trying to invent a flying wing to bomb Evansville. But fortunately for us, they didn't finish in time. And after the war, my father moved to Washington, D.C., where I was born in 1945. Um, and he started Silman Moffat and Rohr, a consulting firm there, and later Silman Moffat and Kowalski. And then um, was a very successful consulting firm. And then um, uh, Caraway started, moved back to Evansville and started building antennas and hired my father as his consultant to design antennas for him. Then um, when I was just about 16 years old, uh, Caraway had a massive heart attack and died. Mrs. Caraway was shutting the company down and Collins Radio asked my father to come out to Indiana and talk to him about buying the company. So he did and he got all the employees together he said he wanted to own half plus one share, but he wanted local ownership. And uh, two of the gentlemen uh, in the company um, did come in. The guy that ran the shop uh, came in and then the, uh, uh, hey, Tom, fun times on Empire when I was with. <laughs> yeah. um, then um, my father bought the company then for around $15,000. And we converted our basement into an R&D lab, and I became an employee of ERI when I was 16 years old. And then later on designed uh, isolation transformers that we used, the, the little one and then the big one that, that I did when I was in college. And uh, 
Then I attended a prep school for six years in Maryland, where they taught you calculus, analytic geometry, physics, chemistry, you name it. It was all in there. And then um, uh, my father in ERI wanted me to go to Cornell University, but my advisor told me I wasn't qualified to go there. So I applied to Cornell and uh, a local guy called me from right near my school. And as he said, he was a former student there and he'd been asked to meet me and see what's going on with me. And so I he said, can you come over after school? And I said, no, because I'm on the lacrosse team at the school I'm in. And he said, oh, you play lacrosse. Can you come over after practice? And I said, yes. So I went over after practice, met with him, talked to him. I'm a, I was a midfielder, starting midfielder. And um, three weeks later, I got accepted at Cornell. So I went up there in the fall and then bought a local paper because I like to read. And there was an article about me in the paper as a lacrosse player coming to Cornell. And I realized that's how I got in. And I did play lacrosse at Cornell for four years. And uh, we were celebrated as the teams that really set the record for Cornell in, in lacrosse. And uh, my advisor was the assistant to the Dean of Engineering who I met with and he said, uh, I want you to take an extra two hour class, your first term in reading and comprehension. And, and uh, I said, okay. And then I told him I was gonna play lacrosse. And he said, no, I said, actually, you're gonna flunk out. You shouldn't even be here academically. I said, okay. So if you ever wanted me to succeed, tell me something like that. So then uh, a second term, I had a, 87.5 QM and I got to meet him again. And he said, how the hell can you have an 87.5 QM when you're supposed to be flunking out? These other students are supposed to be acing our program are flunking out. And I said, sir, the reason they're flunking out is because what you learn in calculus week one, you use in mechanics of solids and physics in week two. So if you screw if you don't have calculus, you're really in trouble here at Cornell. You should tell these students to take a summer class before they come here in calculus. And then, uh, then uh, I got a five-year undergraduate degree from Cornell in electrical engineering, a bachelor of electrical engineering. And then I went back to the dean and asked him if I could come back and get a master's degree. And he got mad at me because they'd had all the classes. And I said, there's other classes I can take. So he said, all right, you can come back, but you have to leave after one term. So I got a master's degree in 1970 in January. And uh, moved out to Indiana and have been here ever since. So when we talk about FM antennas, when I started ADRI, the antennas had little one inch OD members that they radiated. And if they went to the West Coast, a lot of times in the fog, they would go into Corona. And uh, the Harris uh, group contacted me and my father and they said, look, we can't, we can't have these in. The transmitters were getting more powerful and they were causing arcing. So they asked me if I could design an antenna that would survive in, in the fog in California. And I, I said, yeah, I think so. So the early antennas had Corona balls on the end, which had a three inch OD radius. And so the rototiller I designed in 1975 we designed the arms with three inch OD and then tested them with ice and verified that they would not go over two to one standing wave without radomes if they iced up with uh, two or three inches of ice. And uh, then the, uh, if we all think back to 1975, um, in 77, we had the major ice storm up along the East Coast. And one station had a rototiller and everybody else had other antennas with radomes or whatever, heaters. And everybody went off the air except for the rototiller, which went up to two to one and stayed on the air. And after that, everybody in Baltimore and the East Coast started buying them and they're now considered one of the top antennas in FM. So the key thing about the antenna that made it different, it's internally fed, but it's series fed, not shunt fed. So there's no, there's no strap on the outside, which is one of the reasons it works so well. The feed point is fully pressurized 
And the other thing about it is that instead of having one antenna in front of the other one, like others have done, I made them side to side so that the current wouldn't want to flow onto the stem. And as a result of that, when the standards were being developed for downward radiation protection, the rototiller had the top rating according to the testing that was done. Um, so, so looking at an FM antenna, one of the first things you want to do is worry about scattering from the tower, reflections of members, because as we all know, when the, when the field comes out of the antenna and it excites the structure, it induces currents on the, on the metallic members of the structure, and these re-radiate and, and cause an effect on the pattern. So one thing that one one thing that I always tell people to consider when looking to build buy an array of FM antennas is if you know the base spacing, if it's a standard side mount, it's got a wavelength base spacing. You can buy a custom made tower section from us that has the members of the tower spaced vertically a half wave. So the beauty of that is that then you can test the antenna on a range. And we have a 40 acre test range in Boonville, Indiana with two turntables and, and two 200 foot uh, ranges where we can actually measure the performance of an FM antenna on a structure. So if you take the antenna and put it on the land and you put a, a two bay on there and you move them up and down, you pick your pattern. The advantage of the lambda section is that no matter how many bays you have, every bay will have exactly the same scattering profile because of the spacing of the members. So they're custom made for that channel. So that's something that I like to recommend looking at. Um, now, the bandwidth of the rototiller is very good uh, because it's got such a fat arm. And uh, when we first designed it, we borrowed a transmitter facility over near in Jasper, Indiana that a station I'd worked for had. And he agreed to let us come over there in, in one night and do testing. And uh, we fired it up, we threw water on it. We, we made an arc and then watched the arcs extinguish and went through a lot of testing and whatnot. So it's a very, very robust antenna design. But the other thing that people are concerned about is downward radiation. So the, the one thing that you need to know about downward radiation is that if you have a half wave antenna, what they basically do is they, they, they alternate right side up and upside down as you go through the array so that the, that the array will have the proper phase and magnitude per element. And so the rotation through the uh, inner bay is 180 degrees and then you get the other 180 degrees from flipping the element and it works extremely well. And a half wave array, even number of elements has absolutely zero downward radiation. And this was always thought to be the only way to get that. So like with a, uh, situations where they were mounted on uh, AM towers above a studio, they would use a half wave array to keep from uh, interfering with the studio equipment. But then later on, I went to a clinic with Theo and Stutzman out in San Diego. And I was talking to Barry about this earlier this week. And, and uh, I was looking at I was in my room one night looking at the arrays and I ran the half wave. And of course, it goes to zero at the 90 degree point. But all the others had a little bump there. And I got to thinking about it. Why does the, why does the um, half wave work? Well, half wave works because you have two vectors, one this way and one this way. And if you have an even number of elements, they all go to zero and you get no downward radiation. But it, it, so I, I thought about it and I thought, well, what if you had a three bay and you had a three vectors like this, a triangle? Boom, boom, boom. They would have to zero. So I tried it and sure enough, it did. And then I ran a four bay with three, four spacing and it did the same thing. So I came up with a theory of N minus one over N elements. So that if you have to have low downward radiation, like for example, an eight bay, if you made the inner bay spacing seven eighths of of a lambda, it would go to zero. And so the way you do that is you start up here at this bay and you put an elbow to the side of the antenna and go down and into the next bay to get exactly 180 degrees rotation. 
so that the antenna works and you come out the other way and go down to the next bay and so on. So you're basically zigzagging the inner bay line through it. So if you ever have a situation where you're on an area where there's a tourist, whatnot, and you need to get downward radiation protection, it can be done with the N minus one over N theory. Um, the other thing about the uh, side mount antennas are the easy of, ease of installation. And when I moved out to Indiana, I started climbing towers and all the engineers in the industry were just absolutely furious with me because engineers don't climb. Uh, they do now. But um, then, you know, it's just considered taboo. And I, I, my answer was, how do you expect me to design things that go a thousand feet in the air on towers if I've never been up there to see what the problems they have are? And so uh, uh, I, I still climb today at 78 years old. And I was back in New York two weeks ago on the Empire State Building climbing. So uh, you'd think I'd have more sense than that, but that's the way it is. Uh, at any rate, um, when we designed the brackets for the rototiller antenna, um, we were worried about the loading. So initially we looked at a bracket made with standard stainless steel angle material. And then we set up a test with an element on this thing. And we loaded it uh, using a side load pulley with the calculation at 100 mile an hour wind. And the bracket was so rigid that the antenna started to bend. So then we went to a local sheet metal company in Evansville and asked them if they could make us uh, bracket angles out of a thinner material. And then we had to make us a prototype. And then we did the test again. And now the bracket moved at 100 miles an hour and came back. So then we analyzed the the uh, torque spec of the inner bay line and verified that it could take the torque of the bending. And that's the way we did the final bracket for them because before that they were all made out of steel and painted and they would rust and I just hated that. And then instead of a vertical support, we did the, we supported the horizontal piece coming out from the tower by making a, a cage that would, that would catch it and attaching it to the brackets and then back to the tower. So you should, if you're gonna look at the side mount antenna, you need to consider what's gonna happen with the weather, what's gonna happen with ice, what's gonna happen with wind. And that way, you know, it's gonna stay up there. Um, the, uh, the other thing today that people look at is, and more and more this is happening, where they want an antenna that they can add multiple frequencies to it. So we started looking at that. And uh, there are various ways you can tune FM antennas. The way we, we use two methods of tuning them, or actually three, but the primary one is we use a steatite slug, sort of like made out of a steatite ceramic. It, it takes extremely high power. And then what it does is it adds a shunt capacitance. So if you then look at the antenna and you look at the impedance curl, you can pick a point where you can put this shunt capacitance on a Smith chart and it'll move the, all the points down to the center more or less. And then you get, you get your uh, match at the center plus you get your bandwidth for the curl. And because the ante our antennas have such large radiators with three inch ODs, they have very good bandwidth and they, they work. And uh, uh, the antenna was first shown in Chicago at the NAB uh, in 1976. And people kept coming up to me and saying, what the hell is that? I said, it's an FM antenna, it's new. And they said, well, where's the feed, where's the feed point? And I said, it's inside. I said, what? I said, it's inside the antenna, it's fed in series. And the only downside of that is that when you series feed the antenna, it doesn't have a ground. It's not grounded at all. So we had to add a stub to the top, a quarter wave stub that is the DC ground for it. So the transmitters don't build up static. And uh, they all come with them now. Um, 
at any rate, uh, for directional antennas now, as we all know, the FCC has changed the rules so that you can model it with a computer. Uh, finite element doesn't really do a good job, but NEC does a real good job at FM. Uh, finite element works real good at a TV for uh, scattering, but not so much for FM. And, uh, so we do a lot of that modeling, but uh, for uh, multi frequency antennas, you basically have to find a location where you can you can take the, the two frequencies you want and then, or the three, and come down the line as they move. And uh, you can actually reverse the way the impedance goes. If you go to the top of the Smith chart and you push them to the bottom of the Smith charts, they're going apart at the top. If you go to the bottom, now they'll come back together. And then you put the roll to the top, put the slug in, and you can match it. And that's how we get the <coughs> Excuse me. That's how we get the the broadband use of the antenna with two separate stations, as much as thirteen or fourteen megahertz apart. Uh, we've done. We also have a side mount antenna that we call the Axiom, where we use uh, arrays of half wave spaced elements, and we feed them in. Like with well, six bay, you'd have three two bay arrays. And then we tie them together. And then basically because of the bandwidth of the cancellation of the impedances because of their uh, out of phase and whatnot, is we can get 13 or 14 megahertz better than 1.15 1 uh, 1 to one. So we can, we, we put as many as uh, uh, quite a few, like the Empire State Building aux antenna, which is fed in a similar way. It, it, it has, uh, uh, it has uh, operations where it can run 16 class B FM stations into it at one time. And it's designed with that theory of N minus one over N. So it's a three bay with two thirds spacing. And then the screens, if you have a panel antenna with screens and you actually excite the antenna and go inside the, the antenna and measure it, you'll find that the screen produces a 20 dB loss signal inside the screen. And for that reason, if you have a panel antenna, it's anytime your, your flex lines get close to any metal, you've got to ground them because they'll burn holes otherwise. Um, so the, uh, the panel antenna we did for the Empire State Building aux, I knew we were gonna have to climb through it with the aux hot. And with that many FMs, there was no way you could use screens. You had to use uh, solid steel screen reflectors. So we went with uh, with a uh, three eighths inch steel plates, and then as we installed it, we welded seam welded them. And then the next year's inspection, we we're going to have to go back and brush those seams in cold gallon because they're starting to show a little deterioration. But otherwise, it worked extremely well. And uh, when Kevin Fisher came up to do the measurements of it, when we finished building it and turned it on, uh, Hanson was there as well. And Kevin said, you know, he said, you're 100 feet closer to the people on the deck. I'm going to tell you, this isn't going to, this is going to have problems at full power. And I said, well, let's measure. And so we started measuring and uh, we started working around the areas that didn't really have a problem before. And, and finally, when we, we had one sec, we had almost everything. He, he said, all right, well, I, I'll tell you what, the worst part of the roof is over there in the northwest corner. And I can tell you right now, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but it ain't going to meet. So we went over there and, and did the measurements. He came back to me. He said, what the hell did you do up there? I said, N minus one over N. So if you ever have a site where you're in a park or you're near people or you, got, you have to guarantee you won't expose them, consider that option, N minus one over N. And, and uh, we can do that for you. Um, the Lambda Tower as well. Um, we've done a lot of measurements on Lambdas. and. Uh, we're shipping two or three of them right now uh, that people are using to make the scattering all the same for every element, and it, you know, and it works. Uh, our, um, if you're looking at uh, a panel antenna like they have on the Empire State Building, uh, 
They're extremely broadband. They're internally fed and internally pressurized. Uh, and uh, uh, the ones we did for Seattle area on Tiger Mountain, uh, I've been pictures of them when they were covered in ice, just like a huge ice statue, yet no standing weight problems at all because they're so broad. You use a six inch radiator. Um, as far as the install, if you have a crew coming to install your FM antenna, I strongly recommend that you uh, rig them so that you pick like a bay and a piece of line up at a time. And uh, I was out with a crew out in um, Montana one time and uh, the crew was getting ready to install it. And in those days, our antennas had 10 foot matching sections and they had the interconductor stuck in there on the bottom bay. And he was taking up the bottom bay with a 10 foot matching section. I ran over there and I said, you better bring it down. We better put a wire or something to hold that in there in case that inner comes out. He said, oh, it won't come out. So I got it all the way to the top about a thousand feet up and swoosh, here comes the inner. And this station manager just pulled up and he parked three feet behind my truck on the driveway. And that inner flew down and started flying horizontally. And it made a big turn around the tower. And then it headed over to the driveway and came down and swung sideways and whacked down on the pavement right between our vehicles. <laughs> so, so the crew foreman came over and he goes, if you send me another inner, I'll take, I'll take care of it. So I said, okay. So I ordered him an inner. Um, the other things you've got to watch out for is uh, water. And uh, one time in uh, Kentucky, the station had a new antenna they just put up a mine and, and it was leaking like a sieve and the crew was up there Ran all the elements they couldn't find it. So the owner asked me to just come down and see if I could find it. So I was climbing up the tower. I could hear it, and which is why I don't understand why they didn't know this. But anyway, they left the flange loose halfway up the tower. So I tightened that flange up and came down. He said, you found the leak. I said, yeah. <laughs> and then a uh, funny story. I'm going to, we, we did a job in, in uh, Minnesota on uh, there to do a, a station broadband antenna on uh, one of the buildings there in Minneapolis. And uh, they called me up one time and they said, we had a massive storm come through and there's a terrible leak and nobody can find it. Can we pay you to come up and look at it? And I said, sure. So I was climbing up the tower and I got, I could hear the air. I hadn't put 10 pounds of pressure on it and I could hear it going through the antenna. And I got all the way up to the top bay and I was hanging off and I just kept hearing it go up and it kept going up and it kept going up and I was sitting there hanging off. And all of a sudden I realized I was looking at the interconductor in the quarter wave stub through a hole about the size of a silver dollar. So lightning had come down and hit that thing and that storm and caused the leak. So I had a roll of tape in my pocket. So I started taping it up. My radio beep came on and they said, you found the leak, what was it? I told, I told them, I said, you need a new stub out or and another funny story, uh, Oregon brought a new antenna from us for Portland and uh, it was on like an 800 foot tower. And, and um, they had, it was, they said it was holding pressure, but the standing wave kept going off after every rainstorm and they would lose pressure during the storm, but then it would hold pressure. And I've only seen this once in my life, but it was a valuable lesson. So what was happening was, right at the center feed, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the crew had left the flange totally loose. And when they pressurized it, it would blow the O-ring to, to seal the gap in the flanges and hold pressure. But then when it rained, the, the antenna would get cold, it would suck that O-ring in and the water would run down. So I ended up, tightening that joint up and then, but then they had the high standing wave. So I went to the bottom and I opened up the bottom flange and the water started coming. It turned out that the water was all the way up above the second bay from the bottom. <laughs> so I had to take the antenna arms off, drain all the water 
clean them all out, purge it, put it all back together. And it's worked ever since. That was about 10 years ago. Um, so learning to climb has actually been an asset for me in, 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 in antenna work. Um, but again, the, our brackets are designed to flex. Our antennas are designed to be broadband. And Gary Zayner, about 501. Gary Zayner, about 501. Telephones. Um, anyway, um, does anyone have any questions or any directions they want me to go with this? Don't all speak at once. Well, Tom, I'll, uh, I'll ask a, a question here that uh, probably you're going to say is, is sort of irrelevant, but it's one that a lot of stations ask me, and that is balancing power with number of bays. And if you were to be asked what is the optimum, and obviously it wouldn't be a single bay, uh, and it probably would be 12 bays. Where would you think is the optimal place for a station uh, to uh, balance power versus bays? That's a real good question. Actually, that was on my notes to talk about that. I hadn't even looked down at them. Um, but um, what I always do is I, I, right away, I look at the tower height above the terrain and, and whether the terrain is flat or tapering like a mountainous. And uh, I, first thing I do is calculate where the first null would hit. And, and then I calculate where I want it to hit. And then that way you can actually, you can pick your poison. So for example, if you're on a, a plane outside of a city and the city's 10 miles away where most of the people are, you don't really have to worry about where the first null hits or the, but you need to hit it, figure out where the main beam is gonna hit and how fat it is. And the, the fewer the bays, the fatter the main beam and the fewer the, the minor lows. Um, so basically you figure out where you want that beam to bend and that defines the beam tilt. And then for a situation like that, I would fill the first null. And um, if, for example, if it's a 10 bay and you know that you've got problems with the first null and the main beam, you can tilt the main beam beam right at the people and then fill that null. But then if, if you still got a problem then you can you have to add more power and fewer bays to make a fatter fatter shot at the city. And then that works every time. In uh, relation to that question, uh, we've got a station I manage in the Virgin Islands. And uh, right now we have a Shively 80, uh, 6812 uh, three bay. One of the issues that you have in the Virgin Islands is the cost of power. We considered moving to a four bay antenna to decrease the power usage A power. There's like 50 cents a kilowatt hour and uh, was wondering what, again, where the optimum is there for something like that, where you say, okay, the cost of the extra bay compared to um, the power savings. Well, uh, obviously you can compare the cost of the, ex the extra bay to, how long would it take that to repay you on your savings? I mean, you know, it might take five years. So the, question, the first question is, you know, how long are you going to use that station? If you're going to use it for 20 years, then adding a bay makes sense. Uh, the other thing is, run, I would run the elevation plots and look where the people are and make sure that adding bays doesn't eliminate some of my coverage. And you go, you can go back and forth with that. You can add two bays and look at and run it again. And we do that all the time. You know, I program this fits that out. And it, funny story, I was doing a, a job up in Canada at, at uh, Mount Royal. And I designed an eight bay antenna that should have worked perfectly. And they hired a former RCA engineer to come in and do radiation measurements. And he found these real high levels of minor lows from the antenna and I, I ran it on my computer in my, my room that night and I couldn't see it. And just on a whim, I changed the power distribution in the array and matched his data perfectly. So I then went up and to the top of the tower and took a tape measure 
had them turn the antenna off and uh, found out that the arms weren't, the arms were different. Some of them were longer than others. So I found out that what our tech did, our tech is one dimensional. He only sees return loss. He doesn't know antenna theory. So I basically had uh, verified that, uh, that that antenna did that because of the power distribution. So anyway, uh, the, uh, the Canadians agreed to let me fix it. So we took the antenna down and shipped it back. And I set up two tests and I built a near field range using a program that I wrote years ago for um, radiation plots. And uh, the RCA guy was there and, and, I, and they finally, I verified that with one measurement, if I made the arms a different length, you could see that they exactly matched those high lows where that guy found them. But if you made the arms all the same length, the problem went away. And uh, basically I had a near field range set up to do that. And I had the antenna in a building that had see-through walls. And then I set up a path outside to verify it. And then we had a meeting and the RCA engineer said, said, Mr. Selman, we have a feeling that you seem to know what you're doing, but we don't have a clue how you're doing this. <laughs> and he and I said, well, and you know, my program lets me analyze it that way. And then he said, can I have a copy of that program? I said, let me think about it. No. <laughs> so, but anyway, um, my tech now has been directed. You can't use different length arms <laughs> in the array, but uh, it is interesting that things like that can happen. Indeed. Tom, one of the things that, uh, well, from my point of view, I don't climb towers. And with many folks, the first and last time they see their antenna is when it's delivered on the ground. Yes. It, it might be 200 feet up. It might be 2,000 feet up. What kind of maintenance schedule do you recommend for them to check all rings and other connections? Right off the bat, they should keep track of the pressure. And if, if it starts to change, they need to have it inspected. Um, the, the other thing is that um, if you have a major storm, or for example, if you have radomes and all of a sudden you have, you're, you're getting ice effects that you weren't getting before, you might have a radome that's leaking or broken. Uh, that needs to be checked. But um, the, the, the key thing is that to make sure you, like the one thing you don't want to use is to use an inexperienced crew to put it up. Like we had one in Henderson, Kentucky, right across the river from us that we designed for an FM station there. And they brought in a cell crew because they were cheap to put the antenna up. And they had a split bullet on the input and a couple of other things that were wrong. And we went in there and we took the whole thing and redid it and fixed it and it worked perfectly. But you know, I asked them, I said, why didn't you use a why didn't you use a standard commercial uh, broadcast installer, you know, like uh, Tower King or ERI or uh, uh, any of the others we could recommend because we have a lot of subs we use that are really good, like like Mike Lee and and Coast to Coast. Um, but the 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 people getting killed on towers are almost all in the cellular business, mm -hmm. and the reason is that they're just not as well trained as the broadcasters. That's a very good point. Very good point. And one of the other reasons you want an experienced crew, uh, there was a four uh, bay uh, antenna uh, up the road for me a little bit. And the uh, consultant came in to tune it up as the CP was expiring. <laughs> and he spent the whole day there. He couldn't get it below about a three or a four visoir. And uh, he was going crazy and crazy. Finally, they climbed up to the top and discovered that uh, Bay 2 and 3 were upside down to each other. Well, again, that's on, it, I had one in Evansville that was installed by a different crew. And uh, I know the engineer really well. And he called me up and he said, there's something wrong. This isn't working with the dam. So I said, all right, I'm on my way down there. And I was standing there looking at it. 
And I said, uh, so um, what process did you use to get that up there? And he said, well, I sent all of the things all the way up there in the right order. And I said, uh, I don't think so. And he said, what do you mean? I said, look, come here. The center feed's in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a come along hanging in the middle of it from the tower. I said, you know, I mean, I can send a couple of guys over here and fix that, but we're going to have to take the, the antenna apart and, and then literally take pieces down and put the center feed in the right location and then put it all back up there and then get that come along down and make sure it's right. And so we sent a crew in there, spent a day and a half and redid it and it worked like a charm. But it's just an example of, you know, watch what they're doing. I can certainly attest to uh, to Tom from my years of working in the Empire State Building. This And Tom, I'm 72 and I still climb. I'm still insured. Some fool's still insuring me. But uh, many, a, many a day and a night, Tom would climb around the Empire State Building with Paul Sanchez and I and uh, work on the Mini Master and the combiner system. The first time I started at BLS in 2005, I walked into the combiner room and it looked like a submarine. I mean, it was just the most <laughs> fantastic piece of plumbing you've ever seen. And the Mini Master combiner is just about as uh, equally as marvelous, just in a much smaller uh, footprint. But I had several marvelous years working around Empire and, and you know, the, the, the nighttime work that Tom does at Empire after hours, the guy is part bat, I believe. <laughs> Well, I always enjoy working with the with the teams there, and worked with Local Three and Local Forty, and I've worked with you, and I have worked with John Frex, and so many really good people. Hey, Tim, let me ask you a question. Since you're yes. on site experience here, when you were working with Tom, what was he constantly saying to you? Could it possibly have been, "Watch your head, watch your feet, be careful"? Safety. A lot of safety. Um, it's, it, you know, I've climbed over the years, I've climbed all, you know, especially before 9-11 and everything else, I've climbed all over the inside of the Empire State Building with, with Paul Sanchez. And you can get really hung up in a lot of places up there. And, you know, when you open up the hatch and you go outside, I mean, you, you know, I, I've only done that once. And it was uh, uh, tenuous to say the best, but I think safety, you know, double checking everything, making sure that your hardware count is right. How many bolts did you take out? How many bolts did you put back in? Uh, you know, it, it's, this is not a Ikea. You, there's no spare parts left over. You have to know what you're doing up there. And I think safety and then constantly measuring the measuring systems up there for both the mini and the, and the main, there's a lot of measuring systems up there that, that look at all the power, all the visoir, you know, each and every transmitter feeding the Mini Master, which I was more familiar with in my days with Emmis, you know, you have to take a look at that stuff. And I would go up there and take readings and make sure that the forward power was correct. There wasn't any visoir bump on, on any of the transmitters. So a lot of factors involved. I had the, I had the joy, uh, and, and, and I mean that sincerely, uh, some years ago, I was invited on the top of four times square uh, mm -hmm. where uh, Tom was installing uh, the antennas, uh, the tower and antennas. And uh, I was just completely impressed, not only with the professionalism of the work that was going on, but the fact that Tom knew everything about everybody was around him and mm -hmm. safety was number one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We were, uh, we were riding the loads up and putting the TV antennas on top and everything. Tom? Yeah. Tom? Go yes. ahead, Ben. <clears throat> One thing, when you mentioned uh, reduced downward radiation from various combinations of antennas and spacing, even if you use just simply slightly reduced spacing uh, on multi-bay antennas, it'll drop that downward radiation quite a lot. So if you use like 9 tenths or 0.87 spacing on a full wave spaced antenna, it'll reduce the radiation downward by very substantial amounts. And sometimes that's a good economical solution to that problem. If you use N minus one over N to calculate the spacing, which is what we did for the aux on empire. So the three bay aux on empires is, is, is uh, two thirds wavelengths. Right, so it's zero down. It absolutely does not radiate down on the people. Right. So if you have, uh, if you need more, like if you have a, 
at eight bay, you could use seven eight spacing, it will go to zero. But I always use n minus one over n. Now you can also vary that as you know, and then run the program and say, oh, I like this better or whatever. But when you do that, it starts to come up straight down and, and maybe change somewhere else. So, uh, the, Any other the, questions, folks? Any questions you'd like to bring to Tom about your particular situation or something you'd like to learn? Tom, uh, you were mentioning to me that one of the things that you are particularly careful about uh, is the, uh, I think you mentioned lambda sections there, to make sure that the tower was not parasitic in a bad way. Yes. We, we have the lambda tower that, that we designed for the individual station's frequency so that all the antennas have exactly the same scattering. And that's a, that makes it, the radiation more efficient. Um, but we also have a test range where we can set up and put the antenna on that lambda and move it around and find the best location for the covers they want. Because everybody really should know that there's no such thing as a, as a non-directional side mount FM antenna. They're all directional. They're just not filed as directional. So right. ideally you pick your poison. Yes. And, yes. Uh, Sometimes I've heard, I've heard of guys that come out, they'll spend a day or two uh, trying to maximize radiation in one particular area of non-directionality. It's much easier if they come out to the range and spend about three days there and get it all done. And, uh, uh, you know, when I started here, we had a, a range in Newburgh next to a road and next to where they bring the, the trucks full of sewage and dump them out in the field. And uh, it wasn't the most pleasant place to work, but it worked. And I finally went to my boss, Paul Rice, who was one of the owners. And uh, he finally quit this. He quit in 1975 when I was doing the rototiller because he was pissed off. And uh, he, we, you know, I helped negotiate his sale with my father. So we bought him out. But um, he came to me privately in my office and he said, I want to talk to you for a minute. He said, the reason I'm leaving is because I hate you. And I said, why do you hate me? He said, because you change everything. And I said, Paul, if you don't change, you ain't going to be around forever. <laughs> here's, here's another question that has come up uh, to me from uh, folks. Uh, some people think that uh, back in the old days when it was all horizontal polarization, uh, and then they came along with, with vertical and then circular, there are some folks who will tell you that circular isn't even as good as horizontal because the signals will bounce around and uh, they'll cancel out as you get further away from the tower. It depends on what you're using to listen to it. Um, mostly they added the vertical to get to vertical whips on cars, but you can use horizontal receivers on cars. But the truth is that, uh, that, that the circular polarized antennas actually perform better than the, than the, than the horizontal only ring antennas as a rule. Really? I think they do. And I've gone out and listened to hundreds of them. And I gotta admit though, I like those old ring antennas. They were fun to work with. <laughs> you know, they were shunt fed so you could slide the feed, you know, you tune them by moving the feed point and, and then you'd have plates that you could adjust to, to get them the frequency the way you wanted it. Would your opinion change if you were sighted, let's say in the middle of a large city uh, on top of one building with uh, buildings next door? Uh, would that, uh, well, Empire's probably as first, good example as any. The first major project I, I did was the, was the predecessor for the senior road tower in Houston, which was the 12 Bay array on the, on the, on the shell building in downtown Houston. And um, that had nine class C FM stations on it. And I did it literally right out of, I actually designed it while I was in college and did it, spent the summer of 1972, 1971, I guess, in Houston, working with uh, Beasley Construction, putting it all together. And it was finally retired because the city kept building taller buildings 
And finally, it was shattered so bad that they did the tower south of town and did the senior road tower. So, I heard they yeah. couldn't get the equipment out of that building because uh, they couldn't get it in the elevators. <laughs> well, I got it up there. <laughs> I mean, it, it all was basically designed to go up through the elevator to the 85th floor and then through the doors and whatnot. And then, uh, so it, it worked out pretty well. And, and the filters all went up there the same way. And uh, they were really the first version of our uh, constant impedance filter, but it was like a run out com combiner. And then I had a, a third, I had two tanks for the pass band and then a third tank, a quarter wave down line from them that was set to reflect the signal back up so that the three tanks together formed a good impedance and the power went up instead of down and to the load. And I, I assume they're still up there somewhere. Hello, but, Tom. Mark Falig here from California. Hi. I saw you uh, headline today and I wanted to say hi. Well, appreciate and, uh, that. The, uh, one, one of my most memorable visits to your plant was I think an AFCCE outing when we were all over in French Lick. Yeah. And I still vividly remember you riding in on your horse and your <laughs> hospitality and that. And in general, all along, uh, I salute you. And uh, I was for Ann Crabs, the daughter. <laughs> keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. By the way, I've traded, I've traded in any income for a place on the golf course here. Really? Wow. I, uh, before I got on horseback, I I was an expert whitewater kayaker for years. I actually was a guide on the Grand Canyon one summer for the Nantahala Outdoor Center because they were short one guide. And uh, just uh, kayaked all over Central and South America and all over the United States and just really enjoy it. But then I got involved with riding horses and, and then fell in love with a horse and now I've got a ranch. <laughs> That's great. So do you play golf? Always try to. I'm a corporate golfer. Somebody else is paying green fees. I can usually make it off the tee and over the water. There you go. <laughs> I don't keep score anymore. <laughs> hey, Brian? <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, Tom Burt Weiner here. I just wanted to make a comment that there's nothing like a good horse. <laughs> they are wonderful. Like a good antenna. <laughs> Go ahead, Tom, uh, Chris Alexander here. Um, do you have any tips or tricks for getting small amounts of moisture, water out of long transmission lines? Vacuum. We put a vacuum, we'll, we'll seal off the top of the line because you don't want to measure the vacuum into a radome or an antenna. Uh, but then if you send somebody up and put a cap on the line and then pump, get a vacuum pump on it, you can, the water starts to evaporate when it gets to lower pressure and you just suck it all out. Well, I've got a situation in Birmingham, one of your new... Uh... Uh, SHP antennas there, and and uh, it's about 700 feet of three inch uh, uh, heliax, and we've got a uh, we must have a minuscule amount of moisture in it just by the way it's behaving, uh, and uh, we've tried the vacuum pump, but I'm not sure we pulled it down hard enough. Uh, how far down do you need to pull it? You know, I, I, I'm not I don't remember exactly. Um, I will say though that that we were on the Hancock Building in Chicago and. In in ninety uh, two, doing redoing the tower and everything, and changing the antennas and all that stuff, and uh, and Andrew sent over a uh, Trazar, and uh, that was talking to them about it. And they said, "Well, can you do a vacuum on it?" And I did, and the radar went. <laughs> so you got to be careful with that. I will thank you for that. Hi, Tom. Brian Walker, longtime fan, first time caller. Did we lose you? I'm here. Okay, good. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, antenna design and how you can use antenna design 
to uh, affect multipath. Well, obviously, multipath, multipath minimizing multipath, but you well, know. the problem with multipath is it's not it, it's caused by a signal bouncing off something and forming a direct and a reflected path to a point that makes noise. So it, 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 it's kind of hard to, uh, to if you've got a really bad multipath site, it's pretty hard to design an antenna that's not going to do that. Um, I've, uh, I, the scariest multipath problem I had was actually in, in, down in Florida. Uh, when we were we'd done an antenna down there, um, and um, it was a panel type antenna, and we had multiple inputs for three stations, and they complained of terrible multipath. So I went down there, and I went out with a uh, scope and was looking at it, but it didn't look like multipath to me. It just looked funny. So I went back to the transmitter building, and I said, "What what did you change?" And they said, "Oh well, we were running." Uh, uh, separate digital transmitter into the uh, filter but now we've just got a transmitter it, it, originally they had a transmitter that had an internal digital input and an internal analog input but then they ran a separate digital transmitter and we found out that what they did was they didn't terminate the port on the transmitter for the digital signal so what was happening was the signal coming down was going into that transmitter and getting re-radiated and causing this source multipath so when, what, what we did was we put, a, we put a termination on it and the problem was gone. <laughs> so it's a good idea to define what the multipath is. And the way you can do that is to go out with an FIM 71 field meter with a, with a, with a uh, Yagi antenna and, and kind of point it around and see where signals are coming from. Interesting. I solved a terrible multipath problem down in... Uh, in um, uh, the, the Smoky Mountains that way one time was with a team down there and I brought down this huge long uh, Yagi type of antenna, it was about 10 feet long and I had it set up and I was swinging around and you know, and it got right under the transmitters and then I, I found out where the signal was coming back from and once we knew that then we uh, modified the antenna to put a null there and then the multipath literally went away. And no, problem, don't you remember all the fun you had in Dallas Fort Worth? Yeah. Multipath. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So the, to, on a follow-up question, Tom, it, with a with an antenna that has, you know, is, is a 12 bay antenna going to be more prone to multipath than a four bay antenna? Well, the 12 bay antenna is going to have a very narrow main beam. Okay. And and uh uh so probably the, uh, depending on where it was mounted, I would say the four bay would probably have a bigger problem with multipath because it's running more signal down and it, and it can hit things at different elevations. Whereas the 12 bay has got a narrow beam. It might not see them as much. Interesting. But, but, but every side is different. Sure. Interesting. Cause I mean, most of the people that have commented about that, they have, you know, oh, well, a 12 bay is always going to be much more of a multipath problem. But... It depends. <laughs> the, big thing is, the big thing, is, the best thing to do is to figure out where the bounces are coming from and design okay. your antenna pattern so that you don't, you put more energy where the people are and less energy where the reflection is, if you can find that. And sure. I have done that several times very effectively. Tom, in the old days, it was uh, common for folks to uh, tune their antenna a little high so that when ice would come, the transmitter would not react as badly. Uh, is that a real problem with the the newer, the, your your antenna? The rototiller was designed that way. And what we did was we determined what the effect of ice was. And we designed the antenna so it had extremely broadband single frequency input. And so you could actually tune it so that it was about 200 kilohertz high. And then as it started to ice up, the standing wave come down a little bit before it went up. And then, yes, we did that. But then we designed our radome, which we use now. And, and we designed the heaters, which we use now. 
around 78 or so. And then now we can, we, you know, and we just tune it on frequency. And if there's an icy area, we'll put radomes on it or heaters. It's just really a, a case of the more modern antenna has uh, eliminated an older problem. Yeah. But, but the, uh, the other thing we have is the uh, axiom where we design an array of two bay half wave arrays all tied together with individual feeds to each array. And those can have like 12 megahertz better than 1.15 to one. And you can put you know, five or six stations on them without any problem. Well, that's a good question too. Now, what, what kind of return uh, visoir do you consider acceptable or achievable? Uh, obviously, one one to one is not going to happen. Uh, well, if you get one to one or better, that's excellent. If you had one point one five to one, that's okay. When you start getting around one point three or so, you've got problems. And so, what would you do then? Would you call a tower crew in to adjust the antenna, or would you look elsewhere first? Well, I I, I would have a technician and a crew there. Two man crew can do the work. And then uh, get the data and look at it, and and so on. And um, I've done it where we've had the data sent into the shop, and we've played with it here. And one of the tricks we've done is, if you've got like four frequencies you're worried about, you can actually take one of the frequencies, you can take all the frequencies to move them, so one of them is right at the center of the chart. Then you can move the others around until you get them about where you want them. Then you bring them all back out again, and then you bring them around, and then you slug it and that's been a very that's been a very effective tool but but it is a it's it's a fun game it's, it's kind of like a magic yeah and it's another reason to keep a maintenance log and take a transmitter reading from time to time so you have a baseline if you're going to do it you need to study and learn how to use a smith chart effectively i've, I've seen a station uh for instance where over a period of time uh, inner inner mod issues from close by stations caused the uh, filters to get very hot, and this caused a change in the uh, reflected. And it was not a matter of the antenna itself; it was a matter of what was going on in the transmitter room. Yeah, yeah. The uh, uh, if you have a situation like that, you can add a fan to the filter to help cool it. Um, but there's a lot of tricks you can do. So like the Empire State Building filters, there, there's no fans on them. They're just here at rooms air conditioned. But uh, it was fun to I, do. I'm very tempted to run the video of you on the Empire State Building right now. <laughs> uh, Tom, we've, we've passed an hour. Uh, I don't know if, if you're jammed for time this afternoon. I don't know if we have any other uh, questions from the floor. Uh, folks, if you do, please uh, speak up now because uh, uh, we'd like to take full advantage of having Tom with us. And and yet, if you've got a question, hey, don't hesitate. Uh, last year, uh, I remember seeing in Radio, radio World a, a pylon antenna and was interested in your thoughts on the, the pylon antenna. An FM antenna? Yeah. Um, I think it was, I think it was dielectric. Um, yeah, they, introduced they it. It, about two years ago. Yeah, I was looking at it in, in relation to wind load for hurricanes. It, again, in the Virgin Islands, we've got Cat 5 hurricanes that happen way more frequently than I would like. And um, is that is that a viable or are there better solutions? We have excellent antennas that you can use that will handle the wind load and, and, and uh, whatnot. And uh Hold on a second. I don't know if you can see this picture. That's the one. That's me on the Empire State Building with no belt, 1,300 feet above the city. Wait a minute, Mr. Safety, no belt? Well, what happened was that uh, the building asked me if I would take their photographer, Lou Bope, up to the ice shield above the FM. And so he, I, I, 
since he wasn't a climber, I could take him through the inside of the tower, but you can't wear a belt in there because it's too tight. So, and you can't really fall anyway because you're on platforms every 10 feet. So I took him up there and I got him on the ice shield and he, he was safe. I, I sat him down and then he started taking pictures and finally he said, uh, do you mind if I reload my cameras? They were film cameras. I said, no, go ahead. And I looked down, saw something funny. I thought, oh, I'll be right back. I climbed down about, that's when the old RCA was up there. I climbed down, climbed out the gap between the R antenna and the RCA, got on our screen, climbed up the screen, went out to what I was looking at and figured out it wasn't really a problem. It was just sort of optically eluding. And then and Lubo says, hey, can I take your picture? And I said, yeah, if you want to. He said, make like you're working. I said, I am working. <laughs> <laughs> so he so I said, how about this? And, well, you know, and then he took that picture and that, that picture has been all over the world. <laughs> but it was legal then, you know, you could free climb back then. Now it's illegal. There was, there was some crazy person, it's on, it was on YouTube, who climbed a 1,500 foot tower uh, without any uh, AIDS. And uh, when that first came out, a lot of people said, this guy's out of his mind he just bad example back in the 80s we always free climbed i mean in the 70s i used a buchanan lineman's belt yeah we no, had a no hard hat but, you know that no pelicans nothing the rating of the lining lineman's belt was a function of the cow now there's also a picture it's an advertisement uh for wky it was in broadcast broadcasting magazine years and years, like the late 40s 50s and it was when they built their 1500 foot tower they used native american workers who were barefoot without any other safety activity and there was a picture and i can't find it well the iron workers on the empire back in the 30s were all indians yeah yeah so when they uh they started developing these new uh belts they started using these huge hooks on them. Well, the Klein hook on the older belts, you can't roll it out. It can get caught on your shirt and pop out, but you can't roll it out. It's too tight. And it's perfect because you can snap it on and then it's not coming off. But these big ones, they, you can roll them around so that the gate is on your hook, on, on your uh, loop. So a friend of mine, uh, Paul Batsing up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, sent me a new belt he designed with the great big hooks and, uh, a, and a Kevlar rope holding them together and asked me to try them. And so I was down in Florida with this guy and we were on a 500 foot tower and um, I was gonna lean out and work on the antenna and have him hand me the parts I needed. So he was on the opposite side of the tower from me. And I looked at him and I looked at that belt and I said, you know, I don't trust these hooks. I'm gonna tie a clove hitch in this belt. So I did, I leaned out and Friggin' outside hook rolled out on me and I fell, swung on that clove hitch, swung back and shoot, came back to the tower. And I looked at that guy and said, good thing I tied that clove hitch. <laughs> That's probably the closest I've come to getting killed. And took, took, that, took that belt and sent it back to him and said, no, it's no good. You gotta have get smaller, use the little hooks. I got an argument with OSHA about the Klein hooks too. And they kept saying, well, it's gotta have a, safety. I said, you can't roll it out. It, it won't roll out. It, it, it. Well, we're so glad you're here and you're still here <laughs> and we appreciate uh, really the contribution to the industry. Well, thank you. You're too kind. So last call folks, any questions for Tom before we I'll let see, you go? I'll see you up at empire someday, Tom. What's that? Yeah. I'll see you up it. at empire again someday. Absolutely. And, um, Great to see you today. I'm really, really glad you were here. Thanks. And I uh, uh, hope you all enjoyed the program I presented. I did the best I could, but it's, I tend to ramble sometimes. Very much so. The 70 or so folks that were here, I really thank you. We'll have some more watching the video. I'll post it tomorrow. And uh, we really do. I mean, it tells us a lot about you, ERI, things we didn't know, things that need to be known. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody.